So I'm lying in the snow, right? My whole body's shaking and there's, there's blood coming out of my mouth. My friends are panicking, trying to see if I'm okay. And then all of a sudden, I stop shaking. And I'm just still. And it's at this point, they think I've died. But what happened? Oh no. I was snowboarding, stupidly trying to show off in a jump park, approaching a ramp far too fast, slipping on takeoff and doing a backward somersault through the air, landing with a bang. And now all I can see is darkness. And eventually lights. But it's not St. Peter in front of me, it's the paramedic who rushes me to the hospital where the doctor eventually says, Simon, I've got good news and I've got bad news. The bad news is that you've broken your back in two places. But the good news is that you're going to be able to walk again one day. One day. Did I just hear that right? One day. Spend over a week in hospital whilst they build a cast for me which stretches from front to back. It goes all the way from my waist up to my neck. I look like Robocop and I feel like a freak. But the doctor said this is what's going to hold my body back together. Eventually they let me leave and I'm so happy to get home. But to be honest, I'm finding the whole situation really difficult to deal with. I mean, the support of my family and friends is amazing, but it's obviously a shock for them when they first see me like this. My wheelchair, and my cast, looking completely broken. And sometimes they don't know what to say, but they don't need to say anything. I know exactly what they're thinking as soon as they see me. Wow. Poor Simon. He's probably never going to recover. Or maybe I'm just paranoid. Maybe I'm the only person thinking this. I mean, the doctor said I'd get better, but what if I don't? What if I'm going to be like this forever? I know I should stay positive, but it's difficult. Everything hurts so much. All I could see was darkness. But then came the light. A couple of weeks after the accident, I'm sat at home watching the London Marathon on TV with my mum. And I don't know if I'd taken a bit too much medicine that day, but I said, Mom, I'm going to run a marathon next year. And what she said next completely shocked me. But before I tell you, it's important to know that not only was I there in my wheelchair and my cast, having nearly died two weeks previous, but as a teenager, I'd been overweight and had absolutely hated running. I liked sports, sure, but I chose two sports where I could move as little as possible. I played tennis, and I was a goalkeeper. That's literally all I ever did, side to side, side to side. Oof, ice cream time. So when I said to my mom, I'm going to run a marathon next year, I expected her to laugh at me. But she didn't. She said, you could do that, Simon. What? You could do that, Simon. I know you could. What are you talking about? I hate running. Plus, look at me. I can't even move. I can't even walk properly. There's no way I'm ever going to run a marathon. Never mind next year. And that was that. End of conversation. A few days later, I woke, up, I woke up in the middle of the night screaming in pain, as I had done every single night since getting home, because my back would sink into the soft mattress and cause me so much agony that I couldn't sleep. And it was at that point that I said, that's it. Something has to change. And then I thought about what my mom had said. You could do it, Simon. The marathon. Maybe I could run a marathon. I mean, why not? I needed something positive to focus on. 
And it was at that point I realized the only person left to believe in me, who needed to believe in me, was me. And it was on that day that I took my very first step. Literally, I left the house and I took a few steps outside. And it hurt. And I turned around and I walked back. And it hurt. But the next day I went out again and I walked a few more steps. And the day after, I walked even more steps. I kept on putting one foot in front of the other. I just kept on going. And after a few months, I was walking for hours around my hometown, still looking like Robocop, but now I felt good. <laughs> By the end of the physio, I had my cast off, and I promised myself that I would start running in exactly the same way. And I did. The first ever time I went running, it was just for a few meters, just for a few steps outside and it hurt, and I had no idea what I was doing. But the next day I went out again, and I ran a few more meters, and the day after, the day after a few more meters, and I kept on going step by step, and I kept on building up and building up, so much so that against all expectations, just 12 months after lying there in the snow, not knowing whether I was dead or alive, there I was, at the start line of the Paris Marathon 2007, and I couldn't believe it. It wasn't easy by any means. I don't know if anybody here has, has ever run a marathon before, but it's a long way, right? Like, I realized that after four hours, and I was still running, <laughs> is this ever gonna finish? And I, I, I felt pain, and it hurt. But I just kept on going. I kept on putting one foot, in front of the other, just like I'd done when I started to walk again, when I started running. And I knew by that point what I was doing, and I knew that I could finish. There was one point in the run where I did have to stop, because my body, my whole body, literally shivered with happiness when I thought about not only what I had overcome the past year, but when I realized how good it felt to be alive, and how lucky I was to still be here. Crossing the finishing line that day after running 42 kilometers around the city completely changed my life. It might sound strange, but this near-death experience was my wake-up call to life. And in hindsight, I feel lucky that it happened because something quite extraordinary took place during the recovery process. In just a few months, my whole outlook on life changed. I remember at high school, business studies had been my favorite sub subject, and I loved it so much that I went on to university and I studied international management, and I'd had dreams of becoming a rich, wealthy, jet-setting businessman. But everything changed when I got back to university, and I felt completely out of place among my colleagues who were interested in getting well-paid jobs in the city. And I had this very strong feeling that I wanted to do something meaningful, kind of like what I'd felt in France, in Paris, after the marathon, that I'm lucky to be here, and that there was no chance that I was going to waste one second of my life doing something that I didn't love. I found out over time that it's actually quite common for people who go through near-death experiences to want to do something worthwhile with their time afterwards. And I guess they feel like I did, that we're lucky to be here, and that our time is precious. So one thing led to another, and I moved to Vienna. And for the past few years, I've been working for an amazing organization called Teach for Austria, where I've been working and teaching in a challenging school here. And in my first year of teaching, I remember, it was the day after parents' evening, I had an eye-opening experience. The day after parents' evening, um, we were discussing in class how the evening had gone, and um, whether their parents were pleased with them or not. And we ended up talking about how their parents had done at school, and what kind of work they do now. And one girl put her hand up and said, my dad didn't do very well at school, and now he has a job he doesn't like. And a boy put his hand up and said, yeah, my mom also didn't do very well at school, and now she has a job she doesn't like. 
and another boy said the same thing, and I was surprised. So I asked the kids, put your hand up if you think that your parents are happy with their lives. Not one child put their hand up. And I was shocked. But you see, I work at a school where the majority of kids come from socially and financially disadvantaged families, where it's true that in many cases, they did struggle at school. They now are either unemployed or have two to three jobs, and they do struggle to get by. And this has tragic consequences on their children, because they see their parents unhappy and ultimately don't expect to be any different themselves. And I found this so sad. And it was standing in the classroom that I sensed the same darkness, the same doubt, which I had felt after my accident, when I felt like everything was hopeless, like things were never going to get better. And it was standing in the classroom that I thought, and I realized, teaching these kids just English isn't going to be enough. I thought, how can I motivate them? How can I get them to start believing in themselves? And then I remembered the words, you could do it, Simon. The marathon, this big, crazy challenge where somebody had believed I could do something that I never thought possible, but I did it. And like I said, it changed my life. And that made me think of um, this crazy little idea which I'd had in 2010, after running a couple of marathons and thinking to myself, I want to push myself a bit further, I want to see if I can run further than a marathon. And one day here in Vienna, um, I ran one of the underground lines, it's the U4, it's about 18 kilometers, and um, there's five lines in the city. So in total, that's 86 kilometers, just over a double marathon. And I thought to myself, it's a good idea, maybe I'll try and do a double marathon. But in 2010, even I wasn't crazy enough to try that. Like, it would have just been for myself, and I had no motivation to do it. So the idea stayed in the back of my head until this moment in the classroom where I realized, that's it. This is that big, crazy challenge. There's just one thing missing, somebody to believe in them. So that's what I did. I created a run called the U Run, which took place for the first time in June 2014 and has taken place every year since then. And what happens is lots and lots of amazing teachers start running at 3.30 in the morning when the rest of the city is asleep. We start running and we run the first 81 kilometers of the 86 kilometer network. Each and every teacher tries to run as far as he or she can. I found my personal limit, it's 70 kilometers. Each year I get to 70 kilometers, and I say, that's it. I go for a bath, I lie down, but 70 kilometers, I've realized, yeah, I can do that. And the best thing about it is that our own school children join us for the last five kilometers. And this is amazing because these are kids who would never normally think about taking part in such an event. They'd never normally want to run such a long distance. And five kilometers is a long way. Like, they doubt themselves beforehand, and they don't, they don't think it's going to be possible. And I know I myself would have hated teacher Simon for creating such a run. <laughs> and I think some of the kids do hate me before the run starts. But you should see their faces when they start to run. You should see their faces when they cross the finishing line and how proud they are of themselves. This young boy ran with us, and at around the halfway point, he started to struggle. And he said to his teacher that he can't go on, that he's going to have to give up. Look at the determination on his face. Do you really think he stopped running? Do you really think he gave up? Of course he didn't. He kept on putting one foot in front of the other, going step by step, and he finished. And he finished because he believed that he could finish. And that was amazing. But he wasn't the only one. This year, 400 children ran with us. And each and every one of them finished a run. And in doing so, they took a huge step towards realizing that 
they're capable of doing much more than they ever thought possible. So I was lying in the snow, right? It was only because somebody believed in me that all of this happened. Imagine the possibilities if everybody had somebody who believed in them. So, who are you going to believe in? Thank you.